The recent spate of reports that Russian radiochemical defense IKHB troops have been deployed to the Yamal Peninsula in order to combat an anthrax breakout among the local fauna brought attention to a relatively unknown and even unglamorous branch of the Russian armed forces which is tasked with protecting own forces, infrastructure and civilian population from the effects of weapons of mass destruction. With a history dating back to the Russian Imperial Army's independent chemical companies of World War I and extensive service during the Great Patriotic War as smoke laying and flame throwing troops, the best known example of RKHB troops in action was the operation to put out the fire at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which demonstrated their technical prowess and self-sacrificial dedication to their life-saving mission. Even though the Cold War and the prospect of widespread use of nuclear, biological and chemical weapons have receded in the public's mind, having been replaced by terrorism as the most immediate security threat, the recent deterioration of the international situation means that we are likely to see increased usage of these weapons in the coming decades. The growth and the importance of non-state actors as US and NATO proxy warriors in Libya, Syria and other parts of the world also have meant that such actors, confident in their Western patronage, may use prohibited weapons with legal impunity. We have seen such use on several occasions in Syria with moderate rebels using nerve agents shipped from the post-Gaddafi Libya and possibly even Saudi Arabia and more recently resorting to chlorine cylinders. The use of a so-called dirty bomb or radioactivity dispersal device is an ever-present threat lurking in the minds of security planners around the world, including Russia. Finally, given the importance of Russia's agriculture as a pillar of its economy and a component of its national security strategy, the use of pathogens targeting crops and livestock is also a plausible threat that must be countered. While Russian forces or civilians have not yet been explicitly targeted by such weapons, it is a virtual certainty that they will be used if the West's so far unsuccessful hybrid war against Russia continues. With the West growing increasingly desperate to compel Russia to abandon its sovereignty and given its until recently unthinkable policies such as arming radical Islamists and neo-Nazis, providing them with weapons of mass destruction for use against Russia cannot be ruled out either. For that reason, RKHB troops have also been the beneficiaries of the recent Russian military modernization efforts and have undergone an expansion following the drastic post-Soviet cutbacks. The core of today's RKHB troops consists of four RKHB brigades stationed one apiece in each of the four military districts. The post-2008 financial crisis rise in international threat levels has prompted an expansion by reactivating 10 RKHB regiments with each army headquarters receiving a regiment. In addition to conducting radiological, chemical and biological reconnaissance and decontamination, RKHB troops retain the traditional roles of smoke laying and flame throwing, which means their armament even includes the TOS-1 Solzhenpoik rocket self-propelled flame throwing vehicles that have proven themselves in Syria and Iraq against Islamist militants. Historically, the best equipped chemical troops in the world, Russian RKHB troops are continuing that tradition to this day. With the introduction of the Nektar gas-proof suits and the PMK-3 protective masks and the extensive provision of advanced armored reconnaissance vehicles including the BTR-80-based RKHM-6 and MTLB-based RKHM-5. A recent large-scale military exercises have also featured the employment of RKHB units and troops operations under the conditions of simulated contamination. Like other recent Russian military preparations, these efforts are intended with deterrence in mind. Having potent defensive capabilities may be sufficient to dissuade would-be attackers from using such weapons in the first place. However, should deterrence fail, RKHB troops stand ready to perform their missions. There are two major unknown questions concerning the breakdown in relations between Turkey and Russia following the ambush of a Russian Su-24 bomber in the skies above Syria. The first is, what turn of events prompted Turkey's leadership to adopt a course of confrontation with Russia? The second is, why this escalation did not come months sooner when Peymim was far more vulnerable to Turkish attack or blockade? When Russian aircraft first arrived at Khmeimim, the war was going badly for the Syrian government. The terrorists were able to make major advances during the prior months, 
and were close to threatening Damascus itself. Syrian forces were demoralized by their setbacks and suffering from shortages of equipment and ammunition. The Russian air group at that point numbered slightly more than 30 aircraft. The base had no long-range air defenses and only a small ground contingent to protect it on the ground. The bulk of the material for the base and for the rearmament of the Syrian army was only beginning to arrive by Syria Express ships, which were busy traversing the Bosphorus in both directions. The Russian military had not yet demonstrated its combat effectiveness or its long reach. It would do so only after the air campaign reached its full tempo and began to be accompanied by cruise missile strikes and heavy bomber sorties. If Erdogan had decided to launch a ground operation in Syria in September or October of 2015, when the situation presented far more tempting opportunities, Turkish forces would have stood a far better chance of influencing the outcome of the war in Syria than they do right now. Several months later, the situation has changed to such an extent that Turkish intervention has almost no chance of scoring a military success. Khmeimim now hosts over 50 aircraft, including Su-27SM, Su-30SM and Su-35S fighters, which can provide effective fighter defense against Turkish incursions. It is also protected by a multi-layered air defense system, which includes the S-400 high-altitude long-range missile system, Buk M2 medium-range weapons, and Panzer S short-range gun missile vehicles, which are capable of shooting down not only aircraft, but also cruise missiles and guided bombs. Hostile aircraft would also face a barrage of electronic countermeasures that would significantly degrade their ability to target Khmeimim. The cruise missile launches by Russian naval ships and heavy bombers have demonstrated the ability to target Turkish air bases and destroy Turkish aircraft on the ground in the event of escalation of the fighting. Russian bases in Syria also enjoy protection from the constant presence of a naval task force, which includes a missile cruiser armed with long-range anti-ship and anti-aircraft weapons, several anti-submarine ships, and at least one missile corvette. On the ground, the battalion force of Russian troops is hardly the only ground protection of the Khmeimim base. Russian military assistance, including provision of heavy equipment, munitions and military planners and advisors, has returned the Syrian Arab army to an effective fighting condition. In addition, the Syrian army is no longer the only military force defending Syria. Thanks to Russian diplomatic efforts, several Syrian opposition groups have joined the government forces in their struggle against the extremists. Likewise, the Kurdish units, which in the past waged their own uncoordinated struggle against ISIS, have now been fully incorporated into the Russian-led coalition in return for the Syrian government's political concessions. There is also a sizable Hezbollah and Iranian presence in Syria. Considering that none of these forces are likely to defect to Turkey in the event of a Turkish invasion, and that in some cases they view Turkey as their mortal enemy, the Turkish military is not likely to advance very far before suffering heavy losses at the hands of Syria's defenders. Russian and Syrian long-range weapons now include heavy multiple rocket launchers and Tochka short-range ballistic missiles that would be deadly to Turkish armored columns advancing through narrow mountain paths under the watchful eyes of Russian drones and long-range surveillance aircraft like the Tu-214 and the Il-20. Even the prospect of the Bosphorus blockade is not as threatening as it once seemed. The Syria Express is now mainly concerned with providing consumables like munitions and spare parts to the forces fighting in Syria. In the event that the Bosphorus were to be blocked, these supplies could be shipped from the Baltic Sea, and in really urgent cases by air, using the traditional Caspian Iran-Iraq-Syria air route. In the longer term, it is essential that Russian and Syrian forces punch a corridor through ISIS territory and link up with Iraqi forces, and there are indications that once extremists around Aleppo are neutralized, the next major offensive will be launched in the direction of Raqqa. Doing so would not only break the back of ISIS, but also enable the opening of another overland supply route through the Caspian Sea and Iran. The strength of the Russia-led coalition, which seems to have taken all outside observers by surprise, is such that it is probably sufficient to deter Turkish military air or ground assault on Syria. While we do not yet know how this happened, it would appear that Moscow was able to outmaneuver Ankara by placing a highly effective military force 
right under its nose in Syria, and to reverse the course of the war before Ankara was able to react. <laughs> 